uh, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, time appropriate greetings wherever in the world you're, you're joining us from. Um, and we're here for PodChat Live episode 95. And we're very excited about this one. We're recording this on 19th of August 2021. And uh, we are joined by Dr. Lauren Welty, who, um, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a postdoctorate fellow at Queen's University in Canada. Uh, did her, has a PhD in mechanical engineering, which, as we're going to come on to talk about, had a very heavy focus on the function of the human foot, which as podiatrists we are obviously, um, we should be very keen to do. We're going to list to Lauren's work in the comments below, but please do feel free to barrage her research gate and ask her for copies of her work, because as podiatrists, I think it's, it's worth reading. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for, for joining us. I hope you're well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> um, so the topic of the discussion uh, this evening is the windlass mechanism, which I know we have people from all various stages of their career uh, and uh, sometimes pre-career joining us. Um, so please do feel free, wherever you are in your studies, whether you're a post-grad in year one and you've just heard this word or whether you're 20 years qualified and everything in between, please do feel free to dive into the comments uh, while we've got Lauren here for the next sort of 45 to 50 minutes or so, dive into the comments, uh, pick her brains. Uh, we'll try and cover all the bases that we can from the very basic to the more complex. And we'll have some fun along the way, I would hope. So uh, if it's okay with you, Lauren, we might uh, we might just start with, with the, the simple stuff, um, just for, for those that this may be new to. And that is when we refer to the windlass mechanism in the human foot, uh, what, what are we actually referring to? What sort of, what, are, what anatomy comprises this, this mechanism that we refer to? Absolutely. So it primarily affects the plantar fascia. So we're talking about the fan-shaped tissue that's connecting your heel, um, wrapping around the ball of the foot and then connecting to each of your five toes. And it wraps around the metatarsal head. And so for the lesser toes, we don't have sesamoid bones. Whereas under the main the main slip, so along the first toe, we have sesamoid bones that give it a big um, winding motion around, uh, around the toe. And so then when we lift the toes up, um, flex them, or sorry, extend them. I get it backwards. For <laughs> but when you lift the toes up, it pulls in the plantar fascia. And if the plantar fascia is a stiff, very rigid structure, it pulls the heel and then that raises the arch. And so I have a little graphic here, if I can share that. Oh, great. Yeah, we love graphics. <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if you're listening on the podcast right now, then this is the time to head over to the YouTube channel because um, Lauren's got some great graphics and I, uh, if she's going to share them, you're not going to get the best from them on the uh, on the audio podcast alone. <laughs> I'll do my best to describe. <laughs> um, so basically, if we have a foot, um, there's the MTP is the drum of the windlass. And so it was, the windlass mechanism was originally um, basically a cable winding around the drum. And so when the toe is lifted up, it pulls on that cable around the drum. And because the drum is the uh, the metatarsal heads that again pulls on the calcaneus and raises and shortens the arch, and so that would be the windless mechanism as conventionally described. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, can I, I just want to pick up on one thing you said there, and I was really glad you said it. You used the word toes as a plural, <laughs> and, and I think we forget that it does work on the lesser toes. It's just not as a big effect. So that that was that was a good little little good little catch there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's it's definitely worthy of comment because when we're students and we're taught the Jack's test or the Hubscher maneuver, whatever you refer to it, when whatever country you're in, it's very Hallux uh, centric. You know, you grab the someone's weight bearing, you grab the big toe, you dorsiflex. It's certainly no clinical test, uh, not not one that's been named, no eponymous one that I'm aware of that addresses the lesser toes um, in, in a similar kind of test. I certainly know of clinicians that that do it. But I mean, why do you think, um, or what we, let's talk about this. It's worth noting for everyone that the, the windlass mechanism isn't just a big toe thing. It is a, you know, it is an all metatarsal thing. Um, is there much research that's looked at the lesser toes? Is it all big toe? Why, why so much focus on the big toe? Absolutely. So there is a bit of research that's been done on the lesser toes. Um, Paolo Car Carvaggi, um, they did a study in 2011, I think, um, might have been 2009. But they basically measured the, the strain of the plantar fascia in walking and they did all of the slips of the plantar fascia and so you can see that there is a bigger straining effect in the first slip of the plantar fascia and the reason for that is because the metatarsal head is so much bigger in, in, the, in the line of the hallux um, and it also has the sesamoid bones underneath and i think we often forget about the sesamoid bones 
Um, and there's actually quite a lot of variability among people in the shape of the sesamoid bones, how many sesamoid bones there are. We conventionally think about it as having two sesamoid bones, one on the medial and one on the lateral side, but there can be, I've seen up to four, um, all in like little, <laughs> uh, basically in all, all four corners. Um, and that all changes the way that the plantar fascia lines around the metatarsal head. Um, so there's definitely some more, there's a bigger effect of the windlass on the first lot ray of the foot, but there's still absolutely windless effect in the less of toes. Perfect. Good. Um, so, you know, why, why should we, 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 the royal we clinicians, so to speak, um, why should we care about testing for this in clinic? You know, what, maybe we should start by saying, um, what does this test show us? What do we, what have we historically been, um, been looking for? You know, how does it link at all to uh, sort of the pathology that presents or, or some, any, any risk factors for future pathology? What, what, what are, what's your take as an, as an engineer? <laughs> Keeping in mind that I am coming from an engineering side, <laughs> not, the, not the clinical side. Um, I think it's important to know how the what the kind of the material properties of the plantar fascia are. So if the plantar fascia is really really stiff, it's going to change the way that it it uh, changes the shape of the arch. But if the plantar fascia perhaps is degrading a little bit, um, maybe has plantar fasciitis. Um, and the stiffness of the plantar fascia is going down, we're not going to get the same arch shape, shape changing effect. Uh, I can speculate as to why we need an arch shape change and what we like that, that is actually important and how we move ourselves forward. And if the, the windlass might be helping that. And so it's important if we do, if we're doing uh, Jack's test, as I believe it's known, um, and there's a delay in how the windlass, the onset of the windlass mechanism. So if you lift the toe and the arch doesn't change shape, that might indicate that the foot will function dynamically different than if it engages right away. And I'd actually really like to look into that and understand how different feet respond or how different plantar fascia stiffnesses actually change the way that we move dynamically. Great. And, and um, our traditional beliefs about this test, again, I say our, you know, clinicians or, or you know, the general public researchers, um, what, what sort of beliefs do we have regarding the windlass mechanism uh, historically that you think that, that sort of perhaps needed re-looking re at or perhaps, can, you know, we're going to come on to what contemporary work has been done, but what historic beliefs about this this test have we had done? And I think it's important to note, and, and I've heard in a lecture I saw you give, you were very early on in that lecture saying that the windlass mechanism is, is a model. So, you know, and a model is a is a simplified version of reality. So I think it's exactly. worth, worth, worth mentioning that, but within this model, within the constraints of the model, what beliefs have we had that we think perhaps we um, have been holding on to a bit too long that you've seen? Absolutely. So I like that, like, absolutely, the windless mechanism is a model and models are incredibly helpful because they allow us to simplify the complex structure of the foot. And so if we, the windless mechanism specifically tells us how the arch shape is changing. And that's really beneficial. But the problem is when we take that as complete and utter fact and there's no nuance to it, that that's kind of where issues can come into play. And so one of the main assumptions of the windless mechanism is that the plantar fascia doesn't strain. So the plantar fascia is a cable and it does not, it does not stretch. And we know that that's absolutely not the case. We've been measuring strain in the plantar fascia. You can stretch it and um, that change it it absolutely stretches. So there's kind of these two conflicting ideas that the windless mechanism is, we're saying absolutely the plantar fascia is a cable. It changes the shape of the arch perfectly, kind of coupled one to one. And then we also have all this research showing that the plantar fascia strains. And so it was trying to marry those two ideas and understand how the fact that the plantar fascia does strain, how does that change our interpretation of the windless mechanism? And so that was the most recent paper there. Um, that's that was the focus of that paper is understanding how the stretch comes into play with that winding around the metatarsal heads. Perfect. So I think now might be the perfect time. If it's okay for you to talk us through some of the, uh, some of the work that you've done um, more recently, and and perhaps you know layer on top of our our the model and the historic beliefs um a bit more of a contemporary understanding of what's going on at a tissue level um unless there's any questions craig that have come in that um we need to answer um, before we move on now just a few comments that i've been sticking up i mean simon's made a good point there that steel strains as well so it's a it's a non-argument <laughs> you know 
<laughs> absolutely. Perhaps not under the body weight loads, but <laughs> absolutely. Um, sorry. Uh, so the most recent paper. Um, yeah. And feel free to share. I know you've got some really cool images. So again, um, yeah, we're not nice. trying to we're not trying to alienate the podcast listeners and force everyone onto YouTube. <laughs> but, uh, but these it's images are cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's okay. Perfect. So, um, so basically, the research that we did, we used a really in, really neat technology, and that's biplanar. Uh, biplanar video radiography, which is a really fancy way of saying high-speed x-ray. And so we can see we have two cameras that measure how the foot um, is moving using x-ray at, fra at a frame rate of up to 250 frames per second. And so we can then recreate where all of the bones are in the foot um, in three dimensions. And then we can model the plantar fascia fiber from there. So if you're um, watching, you can see there's a Basically, there's bone models on the right, and then there's a plantar fascia that connects all around the sesamoid bones right into the big toe. And in this case, we did just model uh, the, the first ray of the foot, but it would be occurring in the lesser toes as well. And so when the plantar fascia is straining, um, we thought that that might perhaps change the way the windlass is working. And so if you think about the toe trying to uh, extend upwards and then pull on the plantar fascia. If the plantar fascia is stretching, it's going to kind of just take up that slack in the plantar fascia and it's not going to have any change in shape of the arch. And so we wanted to see whether that stretching timing happened during a running strike um, because it would it would basically imply that the windlass isn't functioning as a perfect windlass mechanism. And so we saw that in all of the subjects there was a phase of um, inhibited windlass mechanism is what we called it. Oops, sorry. Um, and so it, um, there's an inhib inhibited windlass mechanism. Right when your heel lifts off of the ground, the plantar fascia is still straining quite a lot at that time. And then the only time there's a pure windlass mechanism is right after heel lift. Um, it happens to stay at a perfect length, which we didn't expect to happen. And so we suspect that's likely because the intrinsic foot muscles and other tissues crossing the arch are kind of balancing the load. Um, so even though the arch is shortening at that time, there's basically this perfect balance of, Achille of the Achilles pulling on the on the heel, the arch structure is holding the plantar fascia at the same length. And it, we just thought it was really interesting that we actually saw this non-straining plantar fascia for at least a single period in stance. And then it was really interesting because after that, we saw the plantar fascia rapidly shorten at the exact same time that the arch is shortening. And it kind of gave it, it kind of felt like it was almost um, a super windless effect where the plantar fascia shortening and the kind of spring-like effect of the, plantar, of the plantar fascia is pulling the arch closer together. The windless mechanism is trying to shorten the arch and it's all be happening suddenly at this, uh, at about 60% of stance. And so we thought that was really interesting. <laughs> and that's kind of how we found the windless mechanism occurring throughout stance. Perfect. So how do we, uh, we clinicians, how do we reconcile this with our coal face daily practice? You know, what's the, um, cool images aside, what's the sort of, a, a, a sort of applicability of this to the way the foot functions and, and for us as people that are sort of, you know, see, you know, seeing people with foot problems? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I don't know that I have a good answer for you. Um, I think thinking about the windless mechanism as a shape, an arch shape changer is important. So if we're looking at push off, like the goal, the goal of push off it for the foot anyway, is to both be a lever to push off of, but also to shorten at the same time and kind of return back to its original shape. Um, and that we have some research going on right now that suggests it's actually really important for helping the ankle propel you forward. Um, and so it's really important that the toe is not limited in the way that uh, it moves. So if we have shoes with a really rigid toe box or really or a sole that's incredibly rigid that prevents the toe from moving naturally, um, then that could potentially cause problems in the long run. I don't know what those problems would be, <laughs> but I imagine that not allowing the arch to move naturally change not allowing the arch to move naturally changes the way you move and ultimately could lead to different pathologies. Yeah, and I definitely want to come on to um, scenarios where someone already has a stiff big toe um, or, you know, 
rocker sole shoes, stiff shoes in the running community. We definitely want to come on to that because it seems remiss not to. Before we do, um, slight detour into like, um, I guess, terminology, pedantry, which um, all the engineers I know are the biggest pedants I know. And I mean that in a very complimentary way, by the way. Uh, but we are, we podiatrists can be as well. Um, a couple of terms that uh, are uh, sort of discussed and argued on, on the various fora within podiatry. Uh, things like the windlass um, uh, engaging, being in engaged or engaging or initiating. Um, mm. Certainly been some pushback I've seen uh, regarding this being sort of erroneously binary. A bit like mm. a, a bit like a light in a in a bedroom being on or off, which yeah. is very very binary. There's there's a there's a switch that's flicked. Um, some people refer to the, the windlass as not engaging or engaging, and it feels like it's this erroneously binary scenario where clearly from a, from a complex structure like the foot under a weight, in a weight bearing scenario, that doesn't feel like that's the right thing to do. Where do, where do you guys, you guys engineers and, and researchers stand on, on this? Is this a pointless argument to have? Is it a discussion of worth? What sort of terminology would perhaps be better? Um, I, think, I think there's some value in it for sure, because if you have a plantar fascia that's slack, it has no tension in it, you're not going to experience any windless effect. And the way that I think about the windless mechanism engaging is having the toe extend upwards and having a con like a complementary shape change of the arch. And that can that can that amount can change based on how stiff the plantar fascia is or how much tension is going through it at that time. And so I think of it more of a continuum in terms of you can have the windlass be engaged but how engaged how, how engaged it actually is can vary broadly based on the the plantar fascia material properties basically and so when we're seeing this inhibited windlass where the plantar fascia is taking up some of the slack of the toe extending that would be an indication where maybe the, the windlass mechanism is starting to engage, but the plantar fascia isn't fully ready to make a shape change of the arch. So there's some value in having the windlass mechani mechanism in be engaged, but there's also more to it than that. There's a continuum of how engaged it actually is. And I think it's going to vary broadly across people just in terms of how their plantar fascia, how stiff their plantar fascia is. Yeah. Craig, you literally wanted to say something. I know you historically yeah. were a proponent of the uh, timing of of, of uh, windlass uh, engagement. No, so I'm just I'm just I'm just trying to keep on top of the comments. So there's a couple of questions there. I don't know whether to bring them in now or later. Um, yeah, bring, bring them in now. Why not? Let's... Uh, I saw Bruce. I saw the comment you put up from Bruce uh, about the, the, the uh, yeah, like the idea. Yeah, it was a good good. Like it, it, think, think of it more of a dimmer switch rather than an on off switch, which is yeah. Um, okay. He's basically okay. he's taken my light switch now. You made it better there, so I'm <laughs> semi annoyed that I didn't uh, say that. But yeah, thanks. But look, you know, just before, so we, like, I mean, there's this this question here, and I, I just, I, I, it's just obviously looking at your research, Lauren. Were, were there different effects noticed in different foot types, higher or lower arches? Were they responding similarly, or something like that? I mean, I know this question specifically on the cavoid foot, but um, what about different foot types and how they might respond? And so we had, I'm not 100% sure, we had a, a spread of foot types, we have high and low arches. Um, so it's, I don't know if they're necessarily like clinically um, flat feet or clinically high arches. However, all of the subjects reacted the same way, which was really interesting. So we saw like this, this inhibition of the windless mechanism, regardless of the foot. And I imagine within that range of participants, there was a range of foot types as well. Um, and you can physically see the shape, like the shape changes in the arch. And we're also doing the work that we're working on right now. We took a spread of, um, we had 20 participants and then looked at all of their arch heights and then took a spread of them. And so that we have a, a, a sample that's quite largely distributed across arch types. And we're seeing that regardless of arch height, the amount that we're able to repel ourselves forward isn't affected by the height of the arch. Oh, that's, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Which I'm not sure we can answer this question. Um, you know, it was more of a clinical question, but the, the and it's probably slightly off topic and, and like I said, more of a clinical type question. But this one's always sort of in, intrigued me somewhat. You know, you've got a say a, a very high arch support type foot orthotic in there pushing on the plantar fascia, and I think the question is: is that 
has that got the potential? Well, one, first it might hurt, but two, has it got the potential to interfere with the win less mechanism? And I don't know whether you've got any views on that. Like I said, it's probably more of a clinical question, but yeah. I mean, from a mechanical standpoint, I imagine it would because you're physically like you're physically pushing on the plantar fascia to some extent, and so if you're doing that, you're probably inducing a little bit of strain in the plantar fascia. That being said, if it's not painful and it's inducing a little bit of strain, you might be moving yourself out of the kind of inhibited windless phase into a more pure windless phase. Um, I can only speculate on that, of course, but well, yeah, I, yeah. I imagine that it's just adding a bit of stretch into the plantar fascia. Um, that being said, if you have an arch support and you're you're not be able to load the, the arch as much, that might change as well. It might change the way that your whole arch is moving um, and trying to recoil at that point in stance. Um, so I imagine there's a lot of different ways that it could go. Yeah, but I know I know clinically something something that I often will do is you. The foot, with the foot up in the air, dorsiflex the hallux, and you you see how prominent that plantar fascia is. And some yeah. people it's prominent, some people it's not. And those that's prominent will often put a groove into the foot orthotic, because right, you right. know you know it's going to hurt if there's too much pressure on it. So that again, I mean, obviously no data to back that up, but that's just something that people tend to do intuitively. Um, mm -hmm. Just just well, just before we got into those questions, Ian made the comment about the timing. And so one question I've got is when when someone's standing. And you grab the hallux and you lift it up up comes the arch one thing you do notice and some people you might get five ten degrees of movement before you see the arch move mm -hmm. and in some people when you grab the hallux and lift it up the arch moves immediately so mm -hmm. i've often referred that as to immediate versus delayed onset how mm -hmm. would that fit into your work that sort of concept um, and whether it's a problem or not you know I don't know if I can say whether it's a problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say that I think that's uh, that's the kind of phase where the plantar fascia is taking up the slack. So you have a the interesting thing about biological tissues is that as they stretch from a very like relaxed point, they start to get stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. And so and different people I believe have different. Um, they start kind of at different points. So some people might start where they have a slack plantar fascia. So if you think about like a rope being all flimsy, uh, they, so they start with a slack plantar fascia. And so until you kind of stretch out that rope, it doesn't actually hold tension until you get to that point. And so if you have a plantar fascia that's already taut before you actually engage the windless mechanism, then you'll be able to have a consequential shape change in the arch immediately. And so I think it's about when that slack is coming out and when there's enough tension in the plantar fascia, um, as, as you stretch it, it, it builds tension. And so as that tension builds up, you end up being able to overcome the forces of body weight and the rest of trying to pull the arch of the foot shorter and higher. Oh, it's just, there's, just, just thinking about that little concept, just how much research is there that can be done just on that? <laughs> and, and, and then, then oh, extending that sure. extending that on relating it to pathology you know is one one extreme more of a risk factor for pathology versus the other one like it's just there is just so much that um can be explored just in that little bit let alone all the rest of it yeah Absolutely. while while we're while we're theorizing about that test because we may as well you know we've got lots of clinicians and students who will be aware of Jack's test, Hubscher maneuver. So we may as well kind of just milk this a little bit longer. Um, again, as Craig said, you know, we have someone standing and we often grab their hallux and dorsiflex it. And as Craig's already alluded to, one thing you're looking for is kind of what he refers to as the timing of, um, mm. of, of the arch movement. But the other thing sometimes you're feeling for is how much force you feel you're having to uh, put in to, to mm -hmm. get things going. Um, with the right or wrong assumption that the harder it is for you to dorsiflex a hallux and, and get the arch to lift potentially the greater forces that are required during gait and extrapolating that on again rightly or wrongly the greater loads on some of the the tissues and the structures if we take that that clinical test the jacks test and we think about it in the concept of its timing and or its force which i think is what a lot of people are documenting is there a way can we is that supported by your thoughts, your theories, your your data. Uh, can we conflate that with your work and understand better? You know, do those tests tell us anything? Do they tell us what tissues may be at risk? Because I've certainly seen some people 
look at that test and say, oh, you know, if you if you if you don't pass this test, then you're more likely to get plantar fascia, plantar fasciopathy, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any any of your work that sort of would sort of support the use the way we're using that test, or is there a way that we that we, that we need to relook at it? Um, I think the thing to remember is that the amount of force that we can physically exert on the toe is not necessarily reminiscent of the forces that are happening during gait. And so the plantar fascia is already quite strained when the heel lifts and the, toe, the toes start to dorsiflex. Um, and so there's already a lot of tension built in the plantar fascia just because the foot has been loaded and stretched out before actually lifting off the ground. Whereas if we're just standing, we may not experience that kind of load. Um, so I think that's one thing to think about. I still think there's value in understanding what kind of the natural resting state of the plantar fascia is, because I do think there would be a difference between someone who has a very, either if their plantar fascia starts not taut or if they start um, very taut. I imagine on the, the extremes of both of those, there would be it would be problematic. If you're very, very taut, you're going to potentially be straining your plantar fascia past its point of kind of no return and starting to do damage to the plantar fascia. But if you have a, a plantar fascia that is um, looser, or kind of flimsy, um, then it's going to be harder to change the shape of your arch and you're not going to get the benefits associated with arch recoil. So I think kind of on those two extremes, there's definitely work that can be done there to kind of understand what that actually means when we're translating it to gait. I don't know that that test specifically would directly translate to a moment in gait, but I think it can tell us about how the foot would function dynamically. Yeah, yeah. Goldilocks had it right all along, didn't she? Avoiding, exactly. avoiding, <laughs> avoiding the extremes. Um, before we... Sorry, go, go on, Craig. Yeah, I was going to say, just, look, just had a, another question from Daniel, and I'll, I'll expand the question out a little bit. He's, Dan, Daniel's asked sort of, you know, about the, the, the influence of the posterior tibial muscle on the windlass mechanism. But that, I, I'll, I'll look, I'll expand that out to um, you've got a, a leg that's externally rotating and a foot that's plantar flexing. You've got the muscles firing. You've got a lot all happening at the same time. My my attempt to answer a question like that be, well, if one of them's not working, the load's going to be increased on all the other parts, not not mm -hmm. just the plantar fascia. So I, I assume that's how, but I'd, I'd like your views on it as well, Lauren. Yeah. No, I think I agree with you um, because, it, because it does support the arch yeah. and would pre it prevents you know a little bit of that arch collapse and so the plantar fascia i think it's sensitive to the arch collapsing and or not collapsing but compressing and flattening and so if it's sensitive to that and the plantar, and the tibialis posterior is able to prevent a little bit of that arch collapse then that will ultimately affect how the arch is functioning and i'm not 100 percent sure about to post uh, timing, I would talk to Jayashni, Dr. Jayashni Maharaj, um, about to post. If you wanted to have a good chat, <laughs> um, she's been on. She's been on actually. Oh, perfect. There you yeah. go. So you already <laughs> have. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I imagine it would would affect it, and it probably changes where you start your windless mechanism because if you're more strained earlier on, then you might be having more of a pure windless effect versus a an inhibited windless effect. Yeah. Now, here's a really interesting question from Simon, and he, he, in a subsequent message, he's corrected his spelling, but it, should we do Jack's test with the ankle maximally dorsiflexed? So we, we, we just norm, normally do it in standing in what would represent mid-stance, um, but he's asked this question about, because I think your work was showing that what happens later on seems to be more mm -hmm. important, so that, that's a really interesting point he's got there. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine that would make <clears throat> the plantar fascia at least a little bit more strained because mm. in maximal dorsiflexion or maximal ankle dor dorsiflexion, you're going to have the Achilles pulling on the arch tissues a little bit as well. Um, so I imagine that would be a little bit closer to the kind of gate, even if you were stepped into um, a fake step forward. I imagine that would also be a little bit closer. Yeah, so he's corrected us. So he's now got me thinking. I might. I've got to go off and see a couple of patients in a few hours. So I think I might try that on them and just see what. <laughs> um, yeah, just 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 try it. Mm -hmm. Standing normally, try and try it again um, with. Sorry, like in the lunge test position for the ankle joint. Just see what if 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 you, I can feel any differences. Yeah, be interesting to try. So thanks for that question, Simon. That was actually got me thinking now. 
<laughs> damn these damn these smart orthotists coming on and making us feel like mere mortals, Craig. We should ban <laughs> this is a podi podiatry chat, don't they? No. Uh, I hope you're well, Simon. Um, could we just quickly talk about the reverse windlass? Because again, it, uh, it's not something that um, probably gets as much love or attention um, when we're learning about it at podiatry school. Um, but then the term comes up, up and we sort of think, oh, well, you know, I know what the windlass is, but could, we, could you just kind of talk us through the reverse windlass mechanism, what it is, why we should care, um, and, you know, does it matter? Absolutely. Um, so the reverse windlass has been around for a while, but it was definitely, like when I was starting my PhD work, I had never heard of it. And it took a, it took a few reads of early early papers to kind of realize that the reverse windlass was actually a thing. And so the reverse windlass is the exact opposite. Oops, you've just frozen there, Lauren. Okay. Let me just... Oh, have we lost? Oh, oh no, that was me just... Yeah, do you want, if you can hear us, Lauren, do you want to just sign out and sign back in? Yeah, you're just frozen momentarily. I don't think that's ever happened before, Craig. No, I know. You, you and I have uh, frozen many a time, which is never a problem because yeah. we're not the ones saying interesting things. But let's give her a few a few seconds. Look, just um, just while we're waiting for Lauren to come back, let's just backtrack. We're talking about doing the Jack's test standing. Um, maximally dorsiflex i mean bruce just made this interesting comment that you know and, and some people they are maximally dorsiflex when they're standing normally so getting them to move the leg forward is obviously going to be an issue um and then but also th he's made the interesting point that if they do lunge forward you take the gastroc out of the equation which perhaps well, does put some tension on the plant only, fascia, only, yeah. only if you test the front foot if you test the back foot then you're fine right yeah well, actually, that's the point. Yeah, I was thinking of the front foot, but yeah. yeah. Um, so both. that's the, the issue. Um, but then I, I, I guess it's the, it's the problem with with, with Lauren's research is what, what position was the foot in when she was doing the testing, um, which hopefully she'll come back. I hope so because no one's no one's uh, no one's logged on to hear us talk. Oh, about look, this. Simon's going to get a patent on the test before anyone rest of any of us start using it. <laughs> there goes modified Jack. Yeah. Hey, Lauren. Hi. Oh, sorry about that. My internet went out. We just made a comment. So Simon's going to patent that um, test of um, do, doing the Jack's test with you. Oh, the, nice. the so we, we, he's got on first. So uh, you terrified <laughs> us there, Lauren. We were treading water and we were just about to drown. So thank you. Sorry, we lost you fairly early on. Um, yeah. you, you pretty much uh, just about started selling us what the reverse wind last was. So I don't, know how far you, I don't know how far you got before you realized that you'd, you'd, uh, you'd lost us. But if you don't mind starting again, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you think about the forward wind list mechanism, that's what I've been talking about the whole time where your toes lift, your arch shortens and is raised. Reverse windless is exactly the opposite. So as your toes platter flex, come down and hit the ground, um, your arch flattens and drops. And so this basically is the plantar fascia kind of allowing the arch to then flatten. And so we saw this at the beginning of stance. And so I started watching people walk barefoot all the time and everyone is walking around and their toe is up and then it comes down and land. As, as you hit the ground, the toes come down and meet the ground. And so the implications of this reverse windless mechanism were kind of unclear to begin with because the toe is obviously pre to some extent preloading the plantar fascia and that was shown um, by the paper I mentioned earlier, the Caravaggio et al. Um, paper and so they show that there was early stance preloading of the plantar fascia but the implication of um the implication of the toes coming down are that the arch is changing shape before you hit the ground and so the arch is actually raised or almost prepared for the contact with the ground and this means this kind of alluded to what we had found er in my uh first paper that we published on this and we had compressed the arch of the foot with the toes dorsiflexed and with the toes plantar flex to see what the implication of um, arch or energy return in the arch was if the windless mechanism was engaged. And we found that when the windless mechanism engage, is engaged, obviously the arch is higher and there's actually more energy absorbed 
when that happens. And so the implication is that when we're coming in in early stance and landing on the ground with our toes up, that there's potentially more energy being stored or it's preparing other tissues to take that load because the plantar fascia doesn't strain during that reverse windlass. So it's basically just kind of letting out the arch and the implication is therefore that other tissues are taking up that load when we hit the ground. And so the reverse windlass mechanism is really interesting and <laughs> warrants more study for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, let's let's apply things more uh, sort of uh, at the you know coal face application, a pragmatic kind of application. If that's okay. So we start talking about footwear and and foot orthoses and pathologies, for want of a better word. So um, let's start with footwear because you know we're all we're all talking about it. And uh, going back to our Goldilocks analogy, if at one end we have the, the, the you know being barefoot and the natural fallacy attached with that and, and the barefoot shoes, the oxymoron that is barefoot shoes. And if at the other end we have the, the uh, I guess, what we're now referring to as the super shoes, although not a great term, but, you know, the very rigid, carbon-plated, very stiff shoes, often they have a very large toe spring or rocker bottom geometry. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems obvious that the, the way the foot functions in both those shoes is going to be different. But let's talk about that in, in the context of the windlass. Um, well, firstly... I, I know you, there's lots of work which we'll come on to whether you're doing uh, in future, which we're all excited about. But is, is this work that's that's been done yet, or is it work that's that's uh, ongoing? Uh, sorry, which work specific? Uh, comparing how the foot behaves in 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 very very different uh, shoes with very very different design features. Oh, um, a bit of both. <laughs> so we we collected the data for a study on how the diff the stiffness of an orthotic affects um, the windless mechanism, and so if you have a very stiff medial arch um, compared to kind of a, a softer orthotic device. Um, how does that change how the arch deforms and how the plantar fascia functions? And if it's designed to prevent strain in the plantar fascia for people who have plantar fasciopathy, is it actually doing that? Is it preventing, um, is it pre preventing an excess plantar fascia strain? And if that's the case, when we apply that, that logic to a group that's um, pathological, do they experience the same things? Why do those orthotic devices work for some people and not others? And so that's one study we've collected the data for, but the x-ray processing is very time intensive. And so we're still processing that data and don't have answers yet. <laughs> Anything in the carbon plated shoes in the, in the pipeline? Cause it's just such a hot topic right now that, um, everyone's talking about it and people love them or hate them um it, it doesn't we seem to lose nuance we seem to have lost nuance here these things are either mm -hmm. magical or they're the the enemy and we know that not, probably not to be true but um any work uh, of yours or anyone else's in, in in your department in the pipeline um not currently i'd love to look into it um and i've talked to a few people about potentially looking into how the carbon plate affects uh the windless mechanism there's a group um oh i think owen park they did a study that showed, I don't know if it was specifically carbon plates, but basically um, when the toe was naturally allowed to move to its range of motion, there was a kind of an economic um, minimum. So basically you were more efficient if your toe was allowed to move the way that it was naturally supposed to move. And so you still got advantages from um, different from the different stiffnesses, but there's kind of like this critical stiffness uh, that matched your MTP range of motion. And so it kind of suggests that the MTP is important in that. And so I'd be really interested to see how that kind of all plays out with a carbon fiber plate and how the different, I imagine there's varying designs of how the carbon fiber plate chain, like it is actually put in the shoe versus if it's embedded in the sole, um, exactly how long it is, if there's room for the MTP to move, all of those things I think will affect how we propel ourselves forward, whether we're moving with better performance or better economy, because those are two different questions too whether we want to just be sprinting really quickly or if we want to be running a marathon and being as economical as possible with the amount of energy we're using yeah, yeah. i think the issue that, that ian i think might be getting towards is that it may or may not make you more economical well we think obviously it does because mm -hmm. what the evidence says but is that exposing you to increased injury risk because it's interfering with my, what might be happening with the windlass um, yeah, these shoes are supposed to be racing flats. They're not training shoes, but they're being used as training shoes. And I, again, there's a whole body of research that can be done just on that alone. Just that the the injury risk versus the economy, and um, I don't think we know yet. Yeah, well, I I find it interesting that people that 
people that sort of find the shoes uh, that we're discussing, the stiff rocker sole, you know, sort of highly toe sprung shoes, people that find those most comfortable and, and just want to spend more of their training hours in them. And I speak mm. as one of these myself, by the way, are people that are very, very limited in the sagittal plane, particularly at the first MTPJ. I have about seven degrees total. Wow. Um, and if you throw in a bit of limitation at the ankle joint as well, um, mm -hmm. then actually, you know, running being a, a sagittal plane um, endeavor, anything that can help out has got to be a good thing. So then the question becomes, I, and I guess there's, there's several questions here, but the question becomes, is the risk of being in a shoe like that, which we know may have negative effects on the windlass, is that risk mitigated by someone who has a very arthritic or degenerative first MTPJ? Because what's the windlass like in that foot to start with? Um, I don't know if there's a good question in there, but just blurted all that out in the order it came in. What, what, are, your, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that's a really interesting question because if you don't have the event and to, uh, if you don't have the advantages of the windless mechanism, then potentially there's no point in paying attention to the windless mechanism in that regard. Mm. Um, that being said, we don't actually know if in gait the windless mechanism is actually causing that shape change of the arch. They happen at the same time, but we don't know that they're actually like that the, there's enough tension in the plantar fascia to kind of overtake all of the other things that are trying to shorten the arch as well. So we don't actually know that the windless mechanism is changing the shape of the arch in gait. And so that's something that we kind of have to think about as well. We think the windless mechanism the mechanism is important, but we don't actually know for sure if it's doing anything. <laughs> Yeah. And you've uh, you've teed up you saying that has teed up my next line of questioning, which was essentially on, on the, you know, the things we don't know, because we sit here talking about this. And when we were students, we were told, here's here's how the foot works. The big toe moves up and the, the arch raises and the, we talked the cable you know, picture that you showed. And it's all wonderful. And obviously, fast forward and many many years and you you sort of realize this is a this is a complex. This is a simplified version of a complex reality. We're mm -hmm. doing these tests, looking at timing and force, and we don't necessarily know uh, what they may or may not predict, either functionally or pathologically. Um, we're looking at shoes, and, and actually, as with all these things, the more you the more you read, the less you feel like you know. So, I mean, let me. <laughs> I feel like I know nothing some days, but let me ask you: um, what what do what do you still not know about this? And and I guess the second part to this is: what do you want to know? And and, and what what sort of future work w would be you know something that you'd really want to look into absolutely um that's a great point um but i think the part that really gets me is i spent this my whole phd um and part of the postdoc looking at the windless mechanism and i can see that it happens when i look at my foot and i lift my toe up and the arch change shape I can see it in all these static situations i can see that it probably happens in date but I don't know for sure what the distribution of tension is across the arch tissues. And I think in order to understand if the windless mechanism is actually able to make a shape change in the arch, we need to understand how, how the force is being distributed across the arch spanning tissues, um, especially as, as you're propelling yourself forward in gait. Um, the Achilles tendon is basically trying to pull pull your whole body forward there's a lot of angle power happening at that time to try and propel you forward and i think it, so basically i want to understand how that achilles force is being balanced by all of the arch spanning tissues by the effects of the windless mechanism and to do that we need to understand how the force is distributed across those tissues but that's a really hard thing to measure because without going in and surgically implanting um devices onto the onto the tissues, we can't actually measure the force. And so part of my, uh, I have a second postdoc lined up to work with Dr. Daryl Phelan um, and from University of Wisconsin. And we're gonna be looking at using a small external device, it's called a tendon tapper. And so basically it taps the tendon and kind of like an elastic band, as you tap it, there's a, a wave that propagates along it. And so if you do that to a tendon, you can measure effectively how much stress is in that tendon externally with just a small little tapping device instead of going in surgically and implanting transducers onto the tissues. So we're going to be looking at how the distribution of load happens across the arch of the foot to be able to understand whether the windless mechanism is actually doing anything in gait. 
Super. Um, let's talk uh, again. I'm just. Uh, you may you may not have an answer to this, which is absolutely fine. But be, I just I'd never forgive myself if I didn't have your brain in front of me and I ask you because you spent your entire <laughs> PhD looking at the fascia, uh, for, and you're 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 an engineer, so a mechanical engineer. So if we make the rather bold assumption that that people who present with pain, plantar fascia or plantar heel pain, um, mm -hmm. and this is a rather bold assumption, but if we if we for the sake of this thought experiment make the assumption that plantar heel pain is significantly contributed to by the loads or the forces that, that you know that, that are being that the plantar fascia is being subjected to and we're sort of artificially separating the foot from a living thinking human being here just for this thought experiment but um your understanding of the human foot from a from an engineering point of view from a you know mechanical point of view um how best would we treat that mechanically so someone comes in with we are assuming mechanical plantar fascia pain in origin what sort of you know we, we've got lots of papers that tell us or oh, something with a with a with a heel raise or an increased drop would be good maybe you know a varus post at the rear for a valgus post at the fore purely from a from a mechanical engineering point of view if if load on the fascia is the generator of pain in someone with plantar fascia pain what does your work tell us about the things we should do at foot level to to mitigate or, or influence those loads that is a great question <laughs> Um, and I think it kind of comes down to whether we're treated, like, if you have a mechanical cause of pain, um, you obviously don't want to be in pain anymore, but is it, is the pain because of overuse? Is the pain because of, uh, heading kind of past a threshold point that we can tolerate? If there, I think there's some questions that would have to be answered there before we can kind of understand whether a straight reduction in load would actually help treat it because if we also don't load our tissues then they're they're not used to having that kind of repetitive loading and then that also can be a, a precursor to pathology and so i think there's kind of a another balancing act there in trying to understand what actually caused that mechanical pain was it just that it was a little bit of strain all like all day you're on your feet all day and that's what caused it or did you cut suddenly in a in playing soccer and it it completely uh, tore a little bit at the at the insertion site right? and those might present very similarly but actually be completely different in origin and so i think kind of understanding that will help understand when to treat it uh, or how to treat it and then if we want to reduce the load in in the plantar fascia then the plantar fascia is generally the most strained when we're pushing off. So if we have those rocker shoes that are kind of preventing the windless mechanism, I imagine the, the, basically that time when you're kind of reducing MTP dorsiflexion, you're probably going to reduce plantar fascia strain as well. That would be my conjecture. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, that makes sense clinically to me. I'm sure Craig would agree. And it's fascinating to us when we see people who would promote being more barefoot or being in a more natural air quotes barefoot shoe to treat heel pain um mm -hmm. and again um just i was just thinking along those lines craig anything from the facebook group uh, since no lots, lots of comments minutes? talking yeah but no, nothing to bring up at the stage here perfect um There's a few a couple of relevant ones there but we can deal with those well, later feel free to bring them up now because uh, as far as the you know my you know i don't want to pretend i i uh, giving the impression I plan heavily for these, I'm, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I wish I should, I should, but I don't. But all my little scrawled notes in front of me, I've ticked off. So feel free to bring in some comments from uh, Facebook. Yeah, well, I just, I just want to this comment that Kevin made that uh, in Hicks's original paper it showed that cutting the plantar fascia eliminated the arch raising effects of the windlass. So it goes back to that comment you made earlier, Lauren, about you know we don't know how much the wind lapse contributes to the arch raising lowering compared in, in relationship to all the other mechanisms that are happening at the same time um mm -hmm. but I, th I think that's consistent with what you were saying we it's, it's the, the the dynamic effect of what's happening at the time mm -hmm. absolutely we have the i'm i'd like to think the plantar fascia and the windless mechanism are changing the shape of the arch but there are incredibly high loads at that time the muscles intrinsic foot muscles are um, stiffening the MTP joints at that time. Um, who's to say that they're not the primary cause of the windless mechanism dynamically? Because in the original papers, um, they're relatively static, low load situations. Um, I think it's unlikely that, that the windless mechanism is doing nothing, but we don't have proof that it's 
doing every single day. Yeah, no. I mean, there are a few other questions there that are much more clinically orientated. I haven't put them up. Um, That's very kind of you, Philip to Lauren. Yeah. I think I feel sure. like I've, oh, I've yeah. rudely uh, bombarded her with clinical questions. I'm feeling a bit guilty, but yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> well, again, uh, the comment here about the, uh, the, the wind lash mechanism stiffens the foot. Um, is there going to be a less demand for muscle action? Well, my answer would be, well, hypothetically, yes. You know. Actually, <laughs> you know the, 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 sorry? <laughs> Uh, so I don't think the windless mechanism stiffens the foot. So that's one of the kind of typical things that we think of is that the windless mechanism can stiffen the foot, but the only way that it can actually stiffen the foot is if it's substantially straining such that it changes the whole stiffness of the foot. So it can, and when we actually, when we engage the windless mechanism fully by dorsiflexing the toes to 45 degrees, we found that the, toe, that the overall arch was less stiff. And we think that's likely because more of the arch spanning tissues are becoming shorter and closer to their kind of slack uh, slack lengths. And that means that they become less stiff because if we remember that biological tissues, as they stretch, they get stiffer. So as they stretch less, they get less stiff. And so when the windless mechanism orients those tissues to be less stiff, um, the overall arch becomes less stiff, even if the plantar fascia can stiffen a little bit. So I don't actually think the windless mechanism is stiffening the foot. I think it can absolutely contribute to the stability of the foot and preventing it from collapsing. But overall, the arch, I think, is actually getting less stiff when the witness mechanism is engaged. Well, what a, what a mic drop that is. Um, <laughs> I'm going to need to take some time with that one. Craig, anything else? Or no, I've just, just looked at the yeah, time. A few, We're about... Just a few more comments there. Okay. So yeah. Let's round up then. We'll, we'll keep an eye on the comments over the next few days because I know as people sometimes watch with delay, they come in with comments and then we'll, we'll um, harass Lauren with them via her e email inbox. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and also just for contributing to the body of work, which again, um, you know, that the allows us to start thinking about the foot as this this variable stiffness spring, which again, you know, I know that you and your colleagues and I know um, Dr. Luke Kelly, who we've had on before, who you've co-authored papers with, all of the, all of you and, and others um, are, are doing this work, which 15, 20 years ago, just wasn't even the way we thought about the human foot. I think it's fascinating. I think it highlights there's 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 more to know than, than we currently know. And I just think that's cool. So I just want to thank you for your time. Um, and uh, and apologies if you get lots of requests via ResearchGate for your papers. But I think from podiatrists, that's got to be a good thing, right? Absolutely. I'll, 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 put, I'll, put a, I'll put a link to some of your papers in the comments when after we've finished. Uh, so, look, so, so thanks so much, Lauren. Um, yeah, it's been really good. The time's gone quickly. I think that I've had a bit of trouble keeping on top of all the comments that are here. Um, so we'll, we'll call it a day. For those who have just joined late, um, come back in 10, 15 minutes, YouTube. Um, sorry, Facebook renders the video. The whole thing will be live. It'll be up on YouTube later today. So um, thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank thanks you so much for having me.